Advaita Vedanta Shivasati Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai Shiva Bhagavad Gita Sattvaja Ki Jai Okay, so we're beginning chapter 2. <coughs> Contents of the Bhagavad Gita, text number one. Sanjaya Uvacha Tatam Tata Kripaya Vistam Asru Purna Kulekshanam Visidantam Midam Bhakyam Uvacha Madhusudana. Sanjaya said, seeing Arjuna full of compassion, his mind depressed, his eyes full of tears. The Sudhana Krishna spoke the following words. Okay, we'll, we'll read Material and lamentation and tears are all signs of ignorance of the real self. Compassion for the eternal soul is self-realization. The word Madhusudana is significant in this verse. Lord Krishna killed the demon Madhu. And now Arjuna wanted Krishna to kill the demon of misunderstanding that had overtaken him in the discharge of his duty. No one knows where compassion should be applied. Compassion for the dress of a drowning man is senseless. A man fallen in the ocean of Nesians cannot be saved simply by rescuing his outward dress, the gross material body. One who does not know this and laments for the outward dress is called a shudra, or one who laments unnecessarily. Arjuna was a kshatriya, and this conduct was not expected from him. Lord Krishna, however, can dissipate the lamentation of the ignorant man, and for this purpose the Bhagavad Gita was sung by him. This chapter instructs us in self-realization by an analytical study of the material body and the spirit soul, as expressed by the Supreme Authority, Lord Sri this realization is possible when one works without attachment to either result and is situated in the fixed conception of the real self. Okay, so this is a very important beginning of the second chapter. Because uh, the example is Prabhupada is saying if a man is drowned and you swim out to where he's in trouble and you grab his shirt and you swim back and you say I saved him but when you show them what you saved you only bought his shirt you didn't bring him back so that example is, is very let's say Correct. Material lamentation and compassion uh, is something that we get confused by because we think, oh, well, that's, that's something bona fide, that's real love, that's real heartfelt feelings. But actually, uh, material compassion is like saving the shirt of the person but forgetting the person and letting the person drown but you got you brought the shirt back uh, so it doesn't mean that real compassion real lamentation are, or don't exist they do but not for the body for the soul so if, if you look at what's happening in the spiritual world, and like what I said the other day was very important, there is no information in the Bible or the Quran or Buddhist writings about the spiritual world. The Quran is very little. Yeah, it's very little, very, very little. So, but there's plenty of information in the Srimad Bhagavatam. I mean, huge amount of information of what's going on in the spiritual world. And 
in the spiritual world, there are many deep uh, feelings of, of love, profound feelings of love. There's also lamentation, but not lamentation based on the body. There's lamentation based on uh, extreme states of love and separation from, from Krishna. So it's, it's a little difficult to explain it uh, because we're used to the bodily conception of life. But it's, it's very similar to looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking that the mirror image of you is actually real. So the mirror image only indicates that there's a real you. It's not, the image that you see in the mirror is not really you. What, what does that mean? It means that uh, if I want to shake your hand and I try and shake your hand with your mirror image, can I shake your hand? No. Right? It, the mirror image only indicates you, are, you exist, but you, you're somewhere else than, than the mirror. Right? So, in the same way, we confuse the compassion for the body as real compassion. That's like trying to shake hands with your mirror image. It's not actually real. The real compassion is for the soul. The real uh, feelings are in relationship to the soul, not to the body. And this, it takes a long, long time for people to realize this because the bodily conception is so powerfully fixed in our mind. So here, Prabhupada says, material compassion, notice the word, word material, <coughs> material compassion, lamentation and tears are all signs of ignorance of the real self. So let's say you love someone and they die and you're crying because you, you know, you're very sad that that person died. Is that real lamentation? Well, it depends on what you're lamenting for. Are you lament lamenting because you'll not see the body of that person anymore because it goes into an oven and it burns and you'll never see them again? Or are you lamenting, like for example, when Srila Prabhupada left his body, many devotees were lamenting. I remember that day. But what were we lamenting for? Uh, actually, Prabhupada himself didn't leave because, look, we're reading his purports today. We're following his teachings today. We're being inspired by him every day. Right? So what is it? Why were we lamenting? Well, we were lamenting for the spiritual association that we will miss. But actually, if you, if you uh, are regularly following Prabhupada's instructions and reading the purports, then uh, you're associating directly with Prabhupada. You see? So, his spiritual presence is here by, you know, the statement that he made. He was asked once, who will, uh, what will happen to your movement after you die? And Prabhupada said, I will live forever in my words. So just like today, we're reading Krishna's words. All right. Sanjaya said, seeing Arjuna full of compassion, so forth. Uh, Krishna has, has spoke the Bhagavad Gita, so we're living, he's still living with us because we're being inspired by his words. And the purports that Prabhupada has given us are, are, is the living presence of him, and it's inspiring us today. So that is a spiritual connection. It's not uh, a material connection. And the association with the Lord is happening or the association with Prabhupada is happening through 
following its instructions, reading its commentaries, and being inspired by it spiritually, because it speaks to our soul, not to the body. Right? So now, what's the difference? Now, I remember when my 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 father died. So everyone in my family was crying, and I was sort of crying a little bit, but I didn't really understand what death was. Right? And then I understood a little bit as it went on that you're not going to see that person again. Right? And but uh, when Prabhupada died or left his body, uh, it was different. I felt as if. Uh, yeah, I felt very bad that I wouldn't be able to. Uh, what happened? Oh, it's a power outage. Wow. Why? I don't know. It's all right. You know where it is. Okay. Okay. What do we do? Yeah. Well, we continue. Well, I have. Yeah, I have one. If I make you a power outage. Yeah. Yeah, it's a wind. This must be windy. It's windy outside. Huh? When you just came now, were you windy? Huh? Yeah, it was yes, windy. Because it's windy. That's, <laughs> see, that's the advantage of the temple. Even when the power goes out, mm -hmm. the temple is connected directly to the city hall. Oh, yeah. it'll, it'll come on right away. Oh. So they, have, they have the power there. That's good enough. No, no, I don't need it. So when Prabhupada, Prabhupada left his body, uh, I remember we stayed up all night and we were having kirtans and then actually I was giving classes also, not the whole time, but we were leading kirtan and then having class, leading kirtan and having class. And I really, I realized that by continuing following Srila Prabhupada's instructions, we're not actually separated from him. Now, my father, did he, my, my birth father, did he give me any instructions? He gave me a few instructions, but nothing that was like, will direct me throughout the rest of my life. Whereas Prabhupada actually gave me instructions and gave all devotees, as he's giving today also instructions, that will guide you throughout the rest of your life. Right? And therefore, uh, lamenting for not having his association, well, that's not actually a fact, because we, are ha we have his association. We have his tapes, we have his purports, we have his books, we have the temples that he set up, we have the lifestyle that he taught us, we have the deities that he gave us. So all that is a huge body of spiritual culture that lives on. And as Prabhupada said, I, uh, uh, when he was asked, said, you know, who, what's going to happen to your movement after you leave? He said, I will, I will live in my words. So, and, and that's what's happening. So uh, the spiritual connection through uh, chanting Krishna's name, offering and then receiving back Krishna's prasadam, worshiping the deity of Krishna, and preaching Krishna's words. All of these things are direct connection with Krishna and the entire parampara, uh, all the disciplic succession. So one is never bereft of a physical or spiritual relationship with uh, okay, with Krishna and and Krishna's devotees. Whereas on the bodily level there is a, uh, a difference because most of the relationships on the bodily level are uh, you know, mundane. Now there are significant relationships uh, in the sense, like, let's say you have a, uh, a close relative that was always very kind to you, 
and helped you in many different ways, gave you good advice, uh, and so forth. Well, you remember that. Those are endearing uh, moments in a person's formative years. And uh, you can't really forget that indebtedness to a person that helped you in that way. But usually, those relationships, for the most part, are, are, are material relationships. And they can be easily, well not easily, but they can be replaced by other material relationships. However, the spiritual relationship is something that lives on and is not subject to deterioration over time. In fact, it gets stronger as time goes by. So usually, you know, when a person dies, people say, oh, we'll always remember you. But actually, uh, quickly they're forgotten. <laughs> You know, and then and then other people come into their life, and then the, their relationship becomes more blurred with the person that died. But in spiritual relationship, the uh, connection becomes stronger over time if it's based on uh, you know this spiritual culture that was given. So when when what Prabhupada is doing here is teaching us the culture of the spiritual world and connecting us to the spiritual world. So that's something you can't really forget. Uh, when you, if you take it seriously, you could never forget it because it's too, it speaks directly to your heart and to your soul. So here, he's, making it, he, he's beginning to explain the difference between material compassion and lamentation and real compassion. And again, it's based on the difference between the body and the soul. So Arjuna is lamenting for the bodies of his family members uh, on both sides of his family that are going to be killed in, in, if there is a fight. Uh, but that is not where, that, that, that is material compassion. Real compassion is, uh, wait, wait, just like we see at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjaya says, in the last couple of verses, he says, As I repeatedly recall this wondrous and holy dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, I take pleasure being thrilled at every moment. It's verse number 76, 1876. And then he says, As I remember the wondrous form of Lord Krishna, I am struck with wonder more and more, and I rejoice again and again. Well, you see, he, as you advance in spiritual life, the impact of the knowledge and the practice becomes more and more realized and uh, it affects you in a way that is different than material relationships. Uh, he also says uh, on seven, text 74, 1874, thus I heard, I heard the conversation of two great souls, Krishna and Arjuna, and so wonderful is that message that my hair is standing on end. And then he says, By the mercy of Vyasa, I have heard these most confidential talks directly from the master of all mysticism, Krishna, who was speaking personally to Arjuna. So, Sanjaya's guru is Vyasadeva. And Vyasadeva has connected him to Krishna. So much so that he can actually hear in real time what Krishna is saying in the battle of Kurukshetra. And he's struck by it. It's, it's, he's wonderstruck by it. Right? So that is a spiritual experience. It's different than material experiences. And it's, it's hard to explain when we're all still attached to the material body. But it's something that we can hear about and try to understand. And as we practice Krishna consciousness more seriously, that understanding becomes deeper and deeper. And then 
uh, one day we realize, you know, what Prabhupada's talking about here, that there's a difference between this material con compassion and spiritual compassion. Compassion means you uh, take great uh, concern about, you, you, you have a tremendous concern about somebody else. Uh, and you are so, uh, let's say, affected by the relationship with someone else that you're willing to sacrifice for that person or help that person in every way possible. So, <clears throat> here, here Prabhupada says, The word Madhusudana is significant in this verse. Lord Krishna killed the demon Madhu, and now Arjuna wanted Krishna to kill the demon of misunderstanding that had overtaken him in the discharge of his duty. Well, he has a duty to perform, and something is stopping him. And he's comparing that to a demon. But he is powerless because of his material affection and material uh, lamentation to do anything. So he's addressing Krishna to help him. If Krishna killed the Madhu, Madhu demon, then he should be able to kill this demon of misconception <coughs> that's holding him back from doing his duty. Now, this is a very profound statement. The demon of misconception. So, what is a demon of misconception? Anything that holds us back from serving Krishna is a demon of misconception. And that's something you have to look into yourself to uh, <coughs> recognize. There are many things that hold us back from uh, serving Krishna. Uh, they can be, uh, it can be fear, it can be ignorance, uh, it can be uh, sense gratification, it can be greed. It can be uh, so many different things based on uh, the material conception of life. So here, Arjuna realizes what his problem is. It's the demon of misunderstanding. <clears throat> and therefore, due to that, he can't do his duty. So now, no one knows where compassion should be applied. So we said compassion is, is the deep feeling you have for another person, and that feeling is so great that you want to sacrifice for that other person. You want to sacrifice something you have, or your own life even, to help that person. Now he says, no one, now Prabhupada is speaking in general terms, no one knows where compassion should be applied. Well, uh, what's he aiming at there? No one knows where compassion should be applied. So now he says, compassion for the dress of a drowning man is senseless. A man fallen in the ocean of ignorance cannot be saved simply by rescuing his outward dress. So this is what's happening. You know, like for example, there's a big homeless problem. So uh, now there's, there's an argument going on between uh, city officials and people who feed the homeless. Uh, City officials say, you're only supporting them to remain homeless by doing that. So, uh, so what, do they, what do they mean by that? Well, uh, they do not see how people feeding the homeless is actually going to help them. Because feeding a person can only help them for few hours, or maybe half a day, right? It doesn't solve their problem, because you have to feed them again and again and again. And if you keep feeding them, then they can become entrenched in, the, in that way of life, 
so they don't really make any efforts to get out. Like, let's say a person is very hungry. <coughs> so then they realize, look, I better get a job. You know, otherwise I and my family will starve to death. Right? So they do everything they can to get a job, any kind of job. Uh, but if uh, they're being fed every day, then they're not so anxious of getting a job. Now, there are some people that can't get a job. They're not qualified in any way, or they might have mental problem, or they might, they might have some physical problem. They can't get a job. So, you know, homelessness has many different categories. It's actually complicated. Uh, some people need to be fed every day, but other people don't really need to be fed every day because they're capable of working. But the fact that they can get by without working because there's so many social services available for them, then they just work the system and remain uh, entrenched in that homelessness. So here, uh, what, what is the real compassion that someone can show a homeless person? Uh, is it simply feeding them? Or is it uh, making some commitment to help them uh, more significant to get out of their homelessness. Uh, so, what <coughs> normally people are willing to do is just throw some money or give some food and then go back to the safety and the comfort of their home. Very few people are willing to invite the homeless person to come and live with them. Uh, would, you, would you do that? No. <laughs> You see, so, so then the other op, uh, option is, okay, throw a lot more money and build some houses for them so they can live there, right? And that's, that's what the American government did in the 1960s and 70s. And that was a total failure because the houses, first of all, they were cheap, well, not houses, but big apartment complexes were cheaply built. And uh, they just became big uh, complexes where people were taking drugs and just deteriorating. You know. So that, that program failed. And then after $30 billion, they spent $30 billion so called to go to the moon. They spent $30 billion to stop homelessness and it failed. Their moon project failed and the homeless project failed. So now the question is how do you help these people? Right? Uh, well, how do you help anyone? You, you can only help them by teaching them Krishna consciousness. Then, the, then they might be able to change completely. Right? But you don't help them, like for example, the city of Seattle helps drug addicts by opening up clinics where they can come and get free drugs and free needles. Now, is that actually helping them? They say, yes it is, because if we don't do that, many of them will kill themselves by overdosing or they be, take up crime. So at least we're helping them not to overdose and not to take crime. But they don't help them get off the drugs. They're giving them free drugs and free needles in a sanitary uh, clinic. So you see, what is actually going to help a person? That's the question. Uh, and, and this compassion for the body usually never helps. <coughs> compassion for the soul, however, has a has, there's a great chance of helping someone. Now, what is that compassion for the soul? We, I saw this with my own eyes, uh, especially early on in the movement. We would accept anyone into the temple, even the worst person living on the street, we would accept in the temple, we'd shave their head, give them dhoti and, and beads, give them a place to sleep, give them plenty to eat, give them, uh, you know, all kinds of spiritual instructions. And many people were helped like that. They, were, they got off of drugs and they became, you know, brahmacharis and brahmacharinis and they took up spiritual life. Right. Now, some of those people fell down again, but many people were seriously helped with a complete change of life. But that was because we were providing not only a place to stay, food, clothing, you know, but spiritual lifestyle. And I saw it with my own eyes. Many, I, I, I helped many people myself, and I, I saw it with my own eyes. 
many people stopped taking drugs, stopped living uh, sinful lives, and became a devotee. It was, it was just an amazing experience. But we had to sacrifice so much to do that. You know, Prabhupada says to make one devotee, you have to expend a uh, hundred gallons of blood. Now, uh, the human body makes one pint of blood every two weeks. So, <laughs> so uh, how many pints are there in a gallon? Well, there's two pints in a quart and four quarts in a gallon, right? Eight, eight pints. Eight pints, right? So, one pint every two weeks, right? So, uh, two pints a month, right? Eight pints uh, would be uh, eight months, right? So, in other words, it takes a long time. It would take years and years to make a devotee. I mean, make a devotee means not, you know, they walk in, you shave them up, and now they're a devotee. No, that means they actually become fixed for the rest of their life in Krishna consciousness. It could take, it ta he said, it takes 100, 100 gallons of blood. Right? So it, it could take years, it takes years to train a person. Why? Because uh, all of us have been in the material world millions of lifetimes. Before you get to the human form of life, it's possible to go through all the 8,400,000 species of life. So now how can you correct that material conditioning of, of millions of births and deaths in one lifetime? It, it seems impossible, but it is possible. But it requires a tremendous effort on the part of the trainers, on the part of the preachers, and tremendous amount of patience. So, so that is compassion for the soul. Compassion for the body is a different thing. Like it, it's it's tenuous. Just like you know, two people get married. I love you. I love you. And after ten years, they get divorced. I hate you. I hate you. So that that was a very tenuous thing. Tenuous means it's not steady. It's not it's not fixed. It, it doesn't get stronger as time goes on. It gets weaker, and then it breaks. So to be able to train a person. And Krishna consciousness means it, it could take many, many, many years. Just like raising a child it takes at least 20 years, right? But it can continue even after that, you know. Uh, but bringing a person to Krishna consciousness and getting them fixed to the point where they'll never leave, it could take a whole lifetime you know, sometimes. So now we're beginning to get a little more idea what difference in compassion for the body and compassion for the soul. There's a world of difference between the two. So here he says, one who does not know this, that it means a difference between the body and the soul, and compassion for the body or compassion for the soul, one who does not know this and laments for the outward dress is called a sudra or one who laments unnecessarily. Arjuna was a Kshatriya, and this conduct was not expected from him. Lord Krishna, however, can dissipate the lamentation of the ignorant man, and for this person, pur purpose, the Bhagavad Gita was sung by him. So, Krishna can dissipate the lamentation of an ignorant man. Well, Arjuna is ignorant, he's lamenting. Just like uh, I once saw a, uh, a you know, a very good devotee, and he was lamenting. And uh, you know, he was crying, and he was in a very bad, you know, state, uh, uh, emotional state. And, and I, I asked someone, I said, what, what's, what's wrong with him? Said, oh, he wanted to marry someone and she said no. Well, he shouldn't have been lamenting, he should have been happy. But, but <laughs> he was lamenting because... Now, uh, sometimes people say to me, you know, Prabhu, how, how is this possible? So-and-so is such a good devotee and they're very greedy. I saw this and uh, how is it possible? They preach, uh, they chant Hare Krishna and they're very greedy. 
or no, or another one would be, oh, so and so is such a good devotee, but uh, uh, they uh, uh, they left Krishna consciousness. How is that possible? They they were preaching, they were doing everything, and they left Krishna consciousness. Right. So, uh, and the same thing here. Arjuna is a chatriya, meaning he has a spiritual vow to protect the principles of uh, dharma. And here he's lamenting and he's saying, I can't do my duty. Right. So how is that possible? It's due to ignorance. Ignorance based on bodily attachment. That's the main thing that holds people back from Krishna consciousness. Ignorance of their soul and it's their eternal relationship with Krishna and very strong attachment to the body and bodily relationships. And it holds people back. And what's, why did Krishna speak the Bhagavad Gita? To dissipate the lamentation of the ignorant man. And for this purpose, the Bhagavad Gita was sung by him. This chapter instructs us in self-realization by an analytical study of the material body and the spirit soul. So this is called Sankhya Yoga, analytical study. You study it in very fine detail. Uh, and that's what Krishna is going to do now. He's going to explain in very fine detail the difference in the body and the soul. Why? Because if we don't understand that difference, we will save the shirt but not the man. Right. You want to save the shirt and not the man? No. The rest of your life? No. Then you better listen very carefully to what's going to be discussed in the second chapter. Because otherwise, the rest of our life will go through saving the shirt, but not the man. And that would be a big, big mistake. <clears throat> Lord Sri Krishna, this realization is possible when one works without attachment to fruit of results and is situated in the fixed conception of the real self. Now, everybody's working, right? Everybody I know works. Even the thief has to work hard. It's not easy to be a good thief. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. You have to plan everything out perfectly. And you can't make any mistakes, otherwise you get caught. Yeah. It's, it's harder work than going to work every day at a job. You know. <clears throat> so, one can realize the difference between material compassion and spiritual compassion only when they work without attachment to fruitive results. That means a person is working, but they become more attached to the result of their work. In other words, the material thing. Just like you know, someone saying, well, today I got $5,000 in the bank. And then they look a little bit later and say, ah, now I got $12,000 in the bank. And they look a little bit Oh, now I got fifteen thousand, but that's not enough. I gotta have thirty thousand. Then they have thirty thousand. That's not enough. I gotta have sixty thousand, right? And then they get sixty thousand. That's not enough. I gotta get six million. Well, you see, <laughs> it's never enough, and and because they're attached to it. This is what happens. There is there is different principles of ignorance. Okay. So one can only overcome this material compassion and the demon of misunderstanding the demon of misunderstanding by working without attachment to fruitive results. In other words, 
one fixes a limit. One says, look, uh, I knew this one man, he was very disciplined. He had a scale in his kitchen. So every time he'd eat, he would weigh the food first. And he made a vow never to eat more than one pound of food a day. Very disciplined. Didn't matter what it was. It was never more than one pound a day. And uh, this man was very, very wealthy. And it, everything he did in his life was like that. Everything was measured. And he made a pre-existing limit to whatever he did. Now, he's not a, he was not a devotee, but he was extremely organized in everything he did. So, the same way we have to make, we have to put a limit on certain things. Otherwise, if we don't, if we don't make a pre-existing limit, then what happens is we become more and more attached to the fruits of our labor and there's no end. There's no end to it. And then one, this realization is possible when one works without attachment to the fruit of results and is situated in the fixed conception of the real self. Well, see, that's the whole question. Who am I in reality? Am I this body or am I the soul in the body? And this soul, what is the soul? The soul is part and parcel of Krishna. Who is Krishna? He's the supreme proprietor of everything. So therefore, I don't own anything. Nir mama. Nothing belongs to me. Everything belongs to Krishna. Therefore, I should work with this understanding. And nothing belongs to me. How do we know nothing belongs to me? Because when we come into the world, we come into the world with empty hands. And when we go out of the world, how do we go out with the world? the world. With empty hands. That means whatever we had in our hands during our life, it doesn't actually belong to us because we came in with nothing and we're going to go out with nothing. See? That is the truth. So, knowing that truth, then what we should, should we do in the middle between when we come in and we go out? We should use everything in Krishna's service. Because what will hold us back from Krishna's service is accumulating things and getting attached to them. And that attachment will hold us back from realizing the difference between the body and the soul. Which means someone chants Hare Krishna, preaches Krishna consciousness, and falls down. That's what it means. Because of that attachment. They didn't actually, they chanted. They preached, they took prasada, they came to the festivals, but they didn't break that attachment to the fruit of results. And because of that, they were not able to understand what is the difference between the soul and the body. You see, there's one purport here. We could go on for hours and hours talking about this one purport. Because Everything is right there. Whatever else is going to come in the rest of this chapter is just going to elaborate what's in here. The few, the few words that's here. This is why Prabhupada is not an ordinary person. He is a Mahabhagavat devotee. Otherwise, it's impossible to put all that information in such a short little paragraph. And information that is world-shattering, if you, if you realize it. It completely shatters the material conception of life. And the material conception of life is what we are taught subtly by reading newspapers, watching television, reading mundane books, engaging in mundane activities. We learn the material conception of life. What is the material conception of life? I'll explain in one minute. Uh, if we look at sixteen, 
Yeah, 16, chapter 1 to 3. Chapter, which verse? One to three. Well, this, uh, yeah, 16 chapter one to three, everything opposite to this, the points in one to three is the material conception of life. So, it says fearlessness. Well, fearfulness is the beginning of material conception. Where does fearfulness come from? It's the first point of ignorance. Not knowing that one has an eternal soul. Thinking I'm just, just the body. So as soon as we feel that I am the body, we become fearful because the body is temporary. At any moment, like for example, Right now, in 36 states in the United States, there's an absolute epidemic of the flu. Right. So far, in every state, people have died from the flu. What's the flu? You get a cold, right? But it's a powerful cold. And eventually, you can't breathe and you die. Right? Sometimes you get so blocked up, you can't even breathe. You can only breathe through the mouth. But if you have some blockage in the esophagus, then you die right away. So they die of the cold. Now, how many people have died so far? Uh, I would say a few hundred people have died from the flu in the United States. Even though we have Tammy flu and all these medicines, they're still dying from it. Okay? Because when the immune system goes down, you can be young or old. Usually very young people and very old people have poor immune systems. You catch a serious cold, that's enough to kill you. Right. Now, there's so many people catch the cold, they don't die, but they suffer. But you don't realize that there are a large number of people that die just from the cold. Not cold weather, but the fact that they got a cold. So, the body... As soon as we believe I am this body, fear begins because the body is temporary and so many things can happen to the body. So that's the first principle of material conception of life. Then purification of one's existence will the opposite of that is contamination of one's existence. So as soon as you think I am this body, you develop fear and uh, you you feel as if a purpose of life is uh, the, uh, oh, well, then from that fear comes ignorance of uh, the, the uh, purpose of life. One thinks that, you know, I should be uh, engaged in bodily activities. So people work out, they get big muscles, and they, uh, uh, take different supplements, and they do all kinds of things to uh, have a more beautiful, powerful body. And what for? To engage in sense gratification. So instead of purification of their existence, they become more and more contaminated. And then, and number three, cultivation of spiritual knowledge. Well, they don't have time for spiritual knowledge because in their estimation, you don't make money with spiritual knowledge. So they want to learn all kinds of mundane things in order to make money. Right? And then charity, well, they believe charity begins at home. So they are charitable to themselves, but they're very stingy. And don't, they're not st they don't give any charity to other people. And then uh, self-control, well, they lose self-control. They're only at the, 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 because they're engaged in self-indulgence all the time. And then performance of sacrifice, no way. They don't want to sacrifice anything. Uh, they want to you know, watch television. In fact, you know, they have these pictures now of people laying down on the couch like this, you know, for hours watching television. Right? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. They show that, like, a lot. Yeah. Right. It's like these lazy criminals just like sitting on Criminals? <laughs> How do you know they're criminals? 
Oh, you mean the comic books? Yeah, and they look like they have the like pictures like masks on them. Do you learn anything by reading a comic book? No. Is it fun reading a comic book? Kind of. It's fun. Why is it fun? Like, for example, let's say you're watching a movie and someone walks into a room. You know, like Charlie Chaplin, you know, and he walks around like this, and has a little thing, and his, uh, and his little hat, you know. And then he sees a chair, and then he looks around, and then he sits down on a chair. But before he sits down, someone pulls the chair. And he ends up on the ground like this. And everyone laughs. Would you laugh if you saw him? Yeah. Okay. So, now the question is, what are you laughing at? Huh? Yeah, you're laughing at somebody else's misery. <laughs> you see, that's what you're laughing at. You're laughing at someone else's misery. Now, see, is that something to laugh at? Is that is that actually a joke to see someone else suffer? If you were the person, exactly right. If you were the person, but you're not the person, therefore you're laughing. It's entertainment to see somebody else's misery. You see. So is that good for you, to learn to laugh when other people suffer? Actually, it's not. It's training you to be insensitive to other people's misery. Like, for example, when you laugh... We're not trying to be cynical here. We're trying to be realistic. You know, Whatever you did during your life, that will appear in front of your eyes at the moment of death. So if most of your life you were coming to the temple, you were serving the deities, you were having darshan, you were hearing Bhagavad Gita, you were ch chanting kirtan, like today there's 20, you know, 10 or 12 hour kirtan, and uh, you were uh, preaching the people or serving the people or cleaning the temple, well, if that's, I mean, e either you do that in the temple or you do it at home also, right? You're off cooking the food and offering it to Krishna, offering to your family members and so forth. So that's your way of life. This was the normal way of life in India before. This is the way people lived their whole life, right? So we're not saying anything strange here. This, this just was the way, that's why India exists today. You know, that's why Sanatana Dharma still exists, because people were practicing that generation after generation. They would live simple lives, they'd build a big, beautiful temple, but they would live simple lives, and their whole life was around the temple. Right? I'm not saying anything strange, am I? That, that was the life in India. Right? They didn't have 24-hour you know, channel television. You know. uh, they, their, their television was the deities, right? and serving <coughs> the deities. And they lived honorable lives. They did dignified, honorable lives. You know? And they were able to raise their families. They did not necessarily <coughs> big rich people, but they had a rich life. So, so at the moment of death, they're thinking of Krishna. They go back to God. And they were not thinking of, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we have to think deeply about this question, you know. I mean, it sounds a little, you know, because of watching movies and all these things, you think, well, Oh, think of Krishna all the time. Oh my God, I can't do that. But that's you know out of the question. No, it's not out of the question. It's the way people actually lived before. This is you read the Bhagavad Gita, you read Bhagavatam, you read Krishna book. This is the way people lived. Their their life was all around Krishna. You know, Mother Yasoda, all the inhabitants of Vrindavan. Did they suffer because of that? No, they've attained eternal life. It's not suffering, that's eternal happiness. Right? So we have to think deeply about it. Well, in Jagannath Puri, they, they live around Jagannath. Right? They're thinking about Jagannath all the time. Everything, the art, the music, the dance, everything's about Jagannath. That's the culture. Okay. So now we'll do, uh, what time is it now? Okay, so we'll do one, verse two, and then we'll stop. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha 
Sukutasva kasmalam medam Vishame samupastitam Anayajistam asvagyam Akirti karamarjuna Okay, who wants to read? Oh, you already read. Yeah, that's the last one to, for today. Like, um, okay, go ahead. You read some of it, and uh, some other people will read too. You read the first paragraph. The Supreme Personality of God had said, My dear Arjuna, how these impurities come upon you. They are not at all benefiting a befitting. man. Befitting a man who knows the value of life. They lead not to higher planets, but to infamy. 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 Not infamy. Infamy. Infamy means uh, really. Uh, infamy means that your reputation is ruined. Not famous. Huh? Famous yeah. in another way. Yeah. Your your, your your reputation is ruined. You're living in disgrace. Okay. Therefore, you learned a new word. Mm -hmm. yeah. Infamy, right? Not infamy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Therefore, Lord Krishna is referred to as Bhagwan throughout the Gita. Bhagwan is. Wait a minute. Is yeah. it, did you miss a line? Start the book. Krishna and the Supreme oh. Krishna and the Supreme Personality of Godhead are identical. Therefore, Lord Krishna is referred to as Bhagwan throughout the Gita. Bhagwan is the ultimate in the absolute truth. Absolute truth is realized in three phrases of understanding, phases of understanding, namely Brahman, or the impersonal, impersonal, all pervasive, or uh, all pervasive spirit, Paramatma, or the localized aspect of the supreme within the heart of all living entities, and Bhagavan, or the supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna. In the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2.11, this conception of the Absolute Truth is explained thus. Vadanti tattva vidas tattvam yajganam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti sapyate. The Absolute Truth is realized in three phrases of <laughs> phases, not phrases. Phases. Phases of understanding by the knower of the absolute truth, and all of them are identical. Such phases of the absolute truth are expressed as Bra Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Okay, good. So, what's the read? <laughs> One of the ladies. Go ahead. Can we explain by the example of her son? which also has two different aspects, meaning the sun, sunshine, the sun surface, and the sun planet itself. One who studies the sunshine only is the preliminary student. Preliminary. Preliminary. Elementary. One who understands the sun's surface is further advanced, and one who can enter into, into the sun planet is the highest. Into the sun planet. Oh, into the sun planet is the highest. Our ordinary students who are satisfied by simply understanding the sunshine, the universal pervasiveness, and the glaring effulgence of its impersonal nature may be compared to those who can only realize the Brahman nature of the absolute The student who has advanced no further can know the sun which is compared to knowledge of the Karmatma feature of the Absolute Truth. And the student who can enter into the heart of the Sun Planet is compared to those who realize the personal features of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Therefore, the Bhaktas are the transcendental <coughs> who have realized the Bhagwan feature of the Absolute Truth are the topmost transcendentalists, although all students who are engaged in the study of the Absolute Truth are engaged in the same subject matter. The sunshine, the, di the sun disk, and the inner affairs of the sun planet cannot be separated from one another. And yet, the students of the three different phases are not in the same category. Okay, very good. Somebody else. Yes. Okay. You already read. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 
The Sanskrit word Bhagwan is explained by the great authority uh, Parasara Muni, the father of Vyasadeva, the supreme personality who possesses all the riches, all strength, all fame, all fame, all beauty, all knowledge, and all renunciation is called Bhagwan. There are many persons who are very rich, very powerful, very beautiful, very famous, very learned and very much detached. But no one can claim that he possesses all riches, all strengths, etc. entirely. Only Krishna can claim this because he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. No living entity including Brahma, Lord Shiva or Narayana can possess appearances as fully as Krishna. Therefore, it is concluded in the Bhagwan Brahma Samhita by Lord Brahma himself that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. No one is equal to or above him. He is Primeval Lord or Primeval Lord or Bhagwan known as Govinda and he is the Supreme Cause of all causes. Ishwaraha Paramaha Krishna Sachitananda Vijaya Anadi Adi Govinda Sarva Karana Karana There are many personalities possessing the qualities of Bhagwan, but Krishna is the supreme because none can excel him. He is the supreme person and his body is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. He is primeval lord. Primeval. Primeval. Primeval, primeval Lord Govinda and the causes of causes. Okay, somebody else read? In, in the Bhagavatam also there is the list of many incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But Krishna is described as the original personality of Godhead from whom many incarnations and personalities of Godhead expand. Uh, all the lists of the incarnation of Godhead submitted here are either the plenary expansion or parts of the plenary expansion of the Supreme Godhead, but Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself. Therefore, Krishna is the original Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth, the Source of both the Super Soul and the Impersonal Brahman. Now, in the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Arjuna's lamentation for his kinsmen is certainly unbecoming, and therefore Krishna expressed his surprise with the word, Wherefore, such impurities were never expected from a person belonging to the civilized class of men known as Aryans. The word Aryan is applicable to a person who knows the value of life and have a, a civilization based on spiritual realization. Persons who are led by the material conception of life do not know what the aim of life is. Life is realization of the absolute truth. Vishnu or Bhagwan and they are captivated by the external features of the material world and therefore they do not know what liberation is. Persons who have no knowledge of liberation from the material bondage are called non aryans Although Arjuna was Kshatriya, he was deviating from his prescribed duties by declining to fight. This act of cowardice is described as a befitting, as befitting the non aryans Such deviation from duty does not help one in the progress of spiritual life nor does it even give one the opportunity to become famous in this world. Lord Krishna did not approve of the so-called compassion of Arjuna for his kinsmen. What is unbecoming? It's, it's very inappropriate. Yeah. So Aryan is a person who knows the value of, spirit, uh, of human life, the goal of human life, and is always engaged uh, in... Or is, it's a civilization of spiritual realization. Right? That's the real meaning. And then Hitler, of course, used, took that word and gave it a completely wrong meaning, uh, materialistic meaning, uh, meaning that the, the Aryans, as they pronounce it in English, are people, you know, tall, blonde hair, blue eyed, Teutonic people who have, you know, racist conception of the perfection of the human species called Ubermensch. There's a German word, Ubermensch means. Uber is a taxi company now, right? <laughs> but Uber is, a, is a, a prefix in German. It means a superman. Ubermensch means superman. So Uber means super. Right? 
So Hitler wanted to create a race of supermen. And uh, he, he even uh, got his scientists to uh, genetically eliminate uh, genes from uh, lesser race races and uh, just to produce uh, people that are, you know, tall, blonde hair, blue eyed, you know, muscular, and uh, like that. So he liked the Polish people because they're blonde, they're very light skinned, they have blue eyes, they're usually tall, and he liked uh, the Germans, they're like that, and the Scandinavians also, they're like that. He didn't like, you know, like the Italians and the French, the Indians, forget about the Indians, <laughs> <laughs> they don't count. <laughs> Did he follow any religion probably? Yeah, it was called Hitlerism. <laughs> New religion. If he had won World War II, he was already deified by the Germans, but if he had won World War II, everyone would have been deified. Everyone mm -hmm. would have considered him like an incarnation of God. Yeah. So you see, uh, they, they borrow these concepts from the Vedas, but, but because Hitler didn't have a bona fide guru, they give their own interpretation of what that word means. It actually means... A civilization based on self-realization, understanding who Krishna is, and who, and understanding one's position as a servant of God. So, persons who have no knowledge of liberation from material bondage are called non-Aryans. Non-Aryans. So, they have no knowledge of what liberation from material life means. So, they are non-Aryans. So, you could say. Almost everyone today in the world is a non-Aryan. They have no knowledge of, it, of uh, how to become liberated from material bondage. Rather, they're proliferating a society with more bondage to material things. You know, just like you know, make America great again. What, what, is, what does he mean like that? You know, more jobs, more money, more this, more that. You know, more. More material happiness. So that's a non-Aryan civilization. Persons who are led by the material conception of life do not know that the aim of life is realization of the absolute truth, Vishnu or Bhagavan. And they are captivated by the external features of the material world and therefore they do not know what liberation is. Persons who have no knowledge of liberation from material bondage are called non-Aryans. Although Arjuna was a chhatri, he was deviating from his prescribed duties by declining the fight. This act of cowardice is described as befitting the non-Aryans. Such deviation from duty does not help one in the progress of spiritual life, nor does it even give one the opportunity to become famous in this world. Lord Krishna did not approve of the so-called compassion of Arjuna for his kinsmen. Uh, you see, so now it's connected that last line to the uh, beginning of the purport to verse number one. It says, false compassion for his family members. That's a very profound concept that most people would not agree with. So what do you mean, not supposed to have compassion for your family members? Well, if that compassion for the body holds you back from self-realization, from spiritual life, then yeah, it's, it's, it's actually maya. And it's holding Arjuna back from following Krishna's order. So it's maya. Anything that takes us away from Krishna is maya. And this, this is, uh, the other night I read the nutshell verses of the... Uh, Shrimad Bhagavatam, and so it says, O Brahma, whatever appears to be of value, if it is without relation to me, Krishna says, has no reality. 
know it to be my illusory energy. That reflection which appears in the darkness. So a reflection already is not the real thing. But a reflection that appears in the dark darkness is even less understandable. Right? So Krishna is saying here, speaking to Brahma, whatever appears to be of value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears in the darkness. So, if you take this one verse and keep that as the theme of your life, then every time you see something or hear something, you should remember this verse. Krishna says, whatever appears to be of value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality at all. So, okay, let's take, uh, for example, Mickey Mouse. Does that have any... It, it has some value, right? You have to pay, I think, $125 to get into this name. If it is without relation to me, it has no reality. Does Mickey Mouse have any relationship to Krishna? Huh? No. So, he says, know it as my illusory energy. It's called Maya, right? He says, rite ritam yat pratyeta na pratyeta chatmani tad atmano mayam yata baso yata tama. O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears in the darkness. So, so what's the word snowball? <laughs> this is Second Canto, ninth chapter, thirty fourth verse. Second Canto, ninth chapter. This is one of the nutshell verses of the Bhagavatam. There are four verses in the Bhagavatam around which the whole Bhagavatam is writ uh, spoken. And there are four verses in the Bhagavad Gita around which the whole Bhagavad Gita is spoken. Those are tenth chapter. Verses number 8, 9, 10, and 11. And this, these are 2nd Canto, 9th chapter, verses 33, 34, 35, and 36. Right. So, so appear as a reflection in darkness? No, no, don't, don't think about that. It just says, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy. Just remember that. So if you see something, hear something, uh, and it has no relationship to Krishna, then that's called maya. Anything that takes us away from Krishna is maya. And this is Krishna speaking himself. It's not me speaking. This is Krishna himself. So we should use that as the theme in our life. If someone says, hey, let's go see... Uh, Batman 3! He said, well, okay, one second. Uh, 2934. <laughs> whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears in dark. Now, excuse me, I'm not going to go to that movie because it has no relationship to it. Or someone said, oh, we're going to go hear this great uh, person who's going to speak, you know, on how to flip houses and become a millionaire in three weeks. You say, okay, wait a minute. What appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusion. No, I'm not going to go. Okay? So, so there you go. You have an absolute uh, benchmark in this verse. Second Canto, 9th chapter, 34th verse. How do you bold? Uh, a little bit after.